known as one of the largest living piston engines ever in aviation. This 28-cylinder marvel was one of a kind in the real working aircraft out there. Brett and Whitney managed to get things right and achieved noteworthy success with it. Although it came too late to be used in the war, it proved useful even after. However, during development, things would not go as easy and the engineers had to think outside the box to finish this challenging assignment. America had not been involved in the World War II yet, but Brett and Whitney knew it was coming and the company's aeronautical engineer, Leonard S. Hobbs, cut the opportunity to design an engineering monster. Today we know that it was the last generation of large piston aircraft power plants and at the same time one of the greatest challenges in the history of piston engine developers. This is the Pratt & Whitney R4360 was major. Its development was tough as it suffered from cooling issues, oiling issues, failing crankshafts and aerodynamic efficiency. It nearly seemed like a mission impossible, but Brett and Whitney would not give up and the was major saw the use of single up to 8 units on an aircraft. Typically for an aero radial engine, they used to be air-cooled, simple and kind of natural in its application. However, cooling such a large engine is not as straightforward as it seems and PNW attempted to design liquid-cooled cylinders. Without a successful effort, the was major was given air-cooled cylinders of 146 by 152 mm from a smaller 18-cylinder R2800. Being a 28-cylinder, the decision was to make it a 4-row radial unit. This equals 4 7-cylinders into a single crankcase, resulting in a 71.5-litre displacement. this is that there needs to be a combustion every 25.714 degrees of revolution and given by a set of seven cylinders in a row it requires 51.429 degrees offset between them. Then the row offset is basically up to the engineers and they settled on a figure of 12.857 degrees. With such a design it gained the nickname corn cob for its pure look. To even out the row offset in the timing the 4th throw crankshaft was designed the same way. Rod Julnus offset by 12.857 degrees plus 180 degrees to issue a single combustion every 25.714 degrees of revolution. To put it into perspective, these are the individual throw angles during a full 720 degree cycle and relative to a throw A. Numbering the cylinders was a tricky task too, with as many cylinders in such a shape. Hence, each row was numbered with a letter, starting at the rear with the A up to D, with the uppermost cylinder being the number 1 and marked clockwise up to 7. They looked at it as 7 inline 4 cylinders and with a single magnetic failure, the engine would only lose 4 cylinders with minimal engine stress due to perfect even firing. After designing the firing order and intervals, the paramount thing is the general internal design and materials of the was major. Aircraft engine makers always look for the best balance between weight and durability. For a radial, engineers had to determine whether to go with a build-up crankshaft with a single-piece rod, a single-piece crankshaft and split rods. Eventually they went for a two-piece master rod, which then holds all the other six slave rods. It was rigorously designed as a single master rod with a single lead and indium silver plane rod bearing and counters over 1100 horsepower and has to cope with it even though a large portion of that does not end at the output shaft. Being a top secret project, some red herrings were implemented not to give away the fundamental design, such as sketching the fifth crank throw and then machining it off later after delivery. 
First cranks tended to break at the crank cheeks, but with the help of a vibration expert, JP Dan Hardgog, counterintuitively, he advised removing some material, and the problem was gone. Ever since the first variant of the WASP series, the R1340, forged aluminum has been found as the best material for crankcases, for its strength and especially low weight. The WASP Major accommodates a 5-piece case, each split readily at the axis of the cylinders. The three middle main crankshaft bearing sections were made of magnesium and pressed inside a steel ring. Cylinders themselves were interchangeable, which was not a common practice in similar engines. In addition, the front section housed a magnetodrive, oil scavenging pumps, and a planetary gear set for a single or twin contra-rotating propellers. The rear housing accommodated a magnesium supercharger casting, intake, carburetor and other accessories. Pushers had fans for additional cooling in the rear section as well and could consume up to 200 horsepower. Having hemispheric combustion chambers and twin spark plugs per cylinder, the R4360 was an overhead valve engine with a single intake valve at the front and a single exhaust valve at the back of the cylinder. There is a cam ring to drive them via push rods, and this engine used five of them, two outers and three inners between the rows. The first operated zero intake valves, the second one managed zero exhaust valves and zero intake valves, and so on, up to the last one operating aero exhaust valves. One of the fundamental problems of a multi-row radial engine is cooling. Even with piston offset, the was major required a different approach. Heads were made of forged aluminum and designed to keep engine stress low and head temperature below 260 degrees of Celsius. Interestingly, materials like copper was considered for better heat transfer, but it's hardly comparable to the weight of aluminum. Furthermore, Special cooling paths were made for each bank, forcing air to enter at the front and cool each cylinder completely up to the rear exhaust side. Engineers really had to think this out, as on a 37 degrees Celsius warm day, the was major required up to 22 kilograms of air each second. No matter how important the cooling was, it made it impossible to accommodate the regular type of intake and exhaust headers. Consequentially, the intake was routed from above. The oil system was not easy to make either. It had dry some lubrication, but scavenging was the main issue, especially as the WASP Major was capable of extremely steep climb angles, during which it would not scavenge no matter what. On the R2800, they gained about 150 horsepower, just improving oil scavenging. Depending on the tuning, it used various types of superchargers, sometimes combined with an intercooler and turbos. The engine was massive, so even the entry model made about 2650 horsepower, but the most of the variants were about the 3500 horsepower figure. The turbocharged model was the most powerful, with 4300 horsepower at 2800 rpm. A Soviet Schwetzen AH2 and BMW 803 were in the same ballpark, with about 82 to 83 liters of displacement, but especially the liquid-cooled BMW, which eventually never left a development stage, was twice as heavy as the WASP Major and had basically the same power. On the other hand, the Soviet unit would consume half of the power just for cooling at 15,000 meters. Just think about it, how difficult it is to create such a marvelous and large engine as the WASP Major. Pratt & Whitney's engine was basically the largest American aircraft unit just before such huge piston engines would not be produced anymore in aviation. Although it came too late for the war application, nearly 19,000 of them were built for dozens of airplanes, which is a tremendous success. The film Aviator introduced two models with the WASP Major, Hughes XF-11 reconnaissance aircraft and the magnificent and gigantic Birchmade Hughes H4 Hercules, nicknamed Spruce Goose, with eight of the WASP Majors. This one can be seen in McMinnville, Oregon. The late development of the WASP Major meant 
that it could not attend the war itself where it was mainly targeted. However, it showed its capabilities and commercial flying, which on the other hand was unprofitable, without a government subsidy. With its absurdly complex design, the retirement of the KC-97 and C-97 US Air Force aircraft in the 1970s marked the end for this specific engine for good. Admit it, who's left speechless seeing the was major in the flesh? 